Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a meeting of the uh, Employment in Hampshire uh, Committee. Uh, and uh, um, I'd just like to start by um, uh, taking any apologies for absence. Well, the, the first one is, uh, and it's almost by way of Chairman's announcements, is that we don't, of course, have Keith Evans with us. Uh, we paid tribute to um, Keith at the council meeting. Um, but he was vice chairman of this committee, and I would, ju would just like to record in the minutes uh, what a supportive vice chairman he was and what a, a, a deep and sensitive person he was in contributing to the work of uh, this committee. It's a tragedy that we've lost him, and I know that many members spoke at the council meeting uh, to pay tribute uh, to him. So I think we should record our, our thanks. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Um, the leader was thinking about uh, attending this meeting. I don't know if Keith is with us, but he, he, he may join us. OK. Um, uh, Roger Huckstep is here. Uh, uh, deputising for uh, Keith Evans. Welcome, Roger. And um, item nine is to exclude the press and the public. So uh, assuming this is agreed, I will ask at that point for the webcast to be switched off. Uh, and uh, then uh, um, we'll continue with a couple of confidential items. And also for the record, um, we have, since the agenda was um, put together, uh, received the news that the chief executive uh, will be retiring in about three months' time, and uh, Jack Broughton uh, is putting together the necessary recruitment uh, process. I think it's very early to start uh, embarrassing him with lots of praise, but uh, I think if he joins us today, this might be John's last uh, EHCC, and it has always been extremely comforting to have him sitting at inside left uh, whispering in my ear and keeping me on track. Uh, so um, we'll uh, uh, we'll uh, do the appropriate things near, nearer the time, but that is an important thing, I think, to note. Okay. Um, the declarations of interest are as normal. Um, if members feel they have a pecuniary interest in any matter to be considered at the meeting, please declare it, and I'm very happy for that to happen uh, as we go. If you don't uh, want to... Um, declare things up front. Sometimes the conversation takes a direction which is unexpected. Uh, so um, please declare any pecuniary interests as we go. Uh, we then move on to the minutes of the previous meeting. Is it your uh, wish that I uh, sign those remotely uh, as uh, an accurate record of what we discussed last time round? Chairman, just a question before you do. I notice in the list of those attending, um, councillors Hiscock and Simpson are listed and they're not members of the committee. I know Councillor Simpson is a, a reserve member in case Councillor House or I can't attend. Is that um, that we're now adopting the practice that we show the reserve members in case they need to attend? Is that what, what this reflects? Ah. Um. Do you know, I don't know the answer to that one, Adrian. Uh, Marie, can you remember whether they were at the meeting or, or just put down as... Um, they're not shown as attending. It's, yeah, it's because they're listed in our system as uh, members of the committee because they sometimes deputise. So right. their names are automatically brought through onto the minutes. Okay. Um, but it's only shown as them attending if they needed to attend. Yes, yes. They don't have an asterisk by them to say they attended. It just jumped out at me as a little bit unusual, but that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you. As long as we understand. So with that question asked and answered, uh, do we accept the minutes as an accurate record? Yes. yes. Great. I see Great. nodding heads, so thank you very much. Uh, ch chairman, don't, don't, chairman, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm getting messages saying I've got bad network quality. I'm going to leave and rejoin. OK, thank you. Right, uh, we'll press on. Um, 
Uh, the next item on the agenda is deputations, and I haven't received notice of any deputations. Any update there, Marie? Uh, no, that's right. We've not received any requests to speak at this meeting. Thank you. Um, chairman's announcements I really put in uh, uh, at the beginning. So um, we'll move on then to item six, which is the pay policy and legislation update to which I think Jack is going to speak. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Reid. So uh, the paper in front of you provides an update on the National Pay Award and proposed employment related legislative uh, changes. So paragraphs uh, seven through to nine update the committee on internal realignments of functions. So with the Director of Transformation and Governments who governance, who has for some time been undertaking a dual role, including Deputy Director of Adults Health and Care Responsibilities, is moving full time to the um, deputy role in adults health and care. And the Transformation and Government Governance Department will be realigned to other parts of the council to support ongoing delivery. Paragraphs 11 through to 14 then cover changes to the national living wage and minimum wage, which EHCC are asked to note. The national living wage will increase to uh, £8.91 per hour from the 1st of April. Um, this is an increase of 2.2%. And the national living wage currently only applies to those who are aged 25 years or over, but from April will also apply to those who are 23 years of age or over. In general, um, as a council, we're not impacted by these increases since the hourly rate for our lowest paid staff grade, so grade A staff, is already above the new national living wage. However, those um, council employees on a six month government kickstart placement will be impacted by the new national minimum wage, which increases uh, ranges for, range from between 1.5% and 3.6%. Paragraphs 15 through 19 then update the committee on the pay award. Government has announced public sector pay freeze for 21-22. However, any public sector workers earning less than 24,000 would receive a minimum £250 increase. We are obviously disappointed in that position. Um, the government does not set the pay for council employees and a pay claim from trade unions is still expected, although in previous years such announcements have resulted in similar outcomes for local authority pay bargaining. We will be consulted on this to inform um, the national employer's position. Irrespective of the government, government's announcements of a pay freeze, in February, recognised trade unions submitted a pay claim to the National Joint Council of at least 10% increase in pay for all council and school support employees. We will obviously provide updates to the committee as required and relevant. In light of the above um, and taking into account the announcements in relation to the public sector employees earning less than 24,000, the budgeted pay provision held has been reduced to 1%, which will be held in contingencies until the pay award is agreed. Paragraphs 20 through to 26 update the committee on the restriction of public sector exit payment regulations 2020. So this is the 95k payments cap and the wider ex exit reforms that were related. As previously reported, the new regulations um, relating to the 95k cap were impl implemented on the 4th of November. These regulations conflicted with existing local government pension scheme regulations, which required changes to be made. In light of this, draft regulations were released to councils uh, and we responded to a technical consultation on these, which closed on the 18th of December last year. Whilst the 95k cap was implemented in November, changes to the local government pension scheme regulations were delayed pending the outcome of judicial reviews that were scheduled for March 2021. However, in February 2021, the government announced that after extensive review of the application of the cap, they had concluded that the 95k cap may have had unintended consequences and the regulation should be revoked. To this end, uh, um, Majesty's Treasury have published directions to disapply the cap until the November regulations can be revoked. Paragraphs 27 through to 35 uh, cover various employment legislation and consult consultation updates, um, starting with announcements of an additional bank holiday for June 2022 to commemorate the Platinum Jubilee. We will obviously be updating our policies and processes 
as necessary. In terms of consultation updates, at the time of writing, we were still awaiting updates on all of the consultations that are listed in paragraph 28. However, the government has responded to the consultation on workplace support for victims of domestic abuse and announced that they will consult further to explore steps that can be taken for victims of domestic abuse, raise awareness and provide support during the current pandemic, and in the longer term, establish a working group to, to um, um, establish practical solutions and best practice in the workplace. The government has also announced that uh, within the consultation outcome that they intend to consult further to encourage flexible working and make flexible working the default unless employers have a good reason not to. Paragraphs 31 to 35 update the committee on the shortage occupation list. You'll be aware that we responded to a consultation from the Migration Advisory Committee, who subsequently recommended that senior care workers would be added to the shortage occupation list, in addition that we had requested through that consultation. The government had, had at the time of writing, decided not to immediately accept any of the recommendations from the uh, Migration Advisory Committee on the basis that they wanted to assess the impact of the new points-based immigration system following the recovery from COVID-19. However, since the paper was produced, it has been reported that the Home Office have now added senior care workers to the short shortage occupation list in order to help plug vacancies in the social care sector. As you might expect, we're extremely pleased to receive this update. Uh, finally, uh, the paper reports our nationality profile in that we estimate we have um, circa 350 EU nationals employed by the council and 400 plus employed in Hampshire schools. We regularly communicate to provide advice about how they can apply for EU settlement scheme to protect their rights to live in the UK. Our data remains largely unchanged and we continue to actively engage with our workforce in line with information coming from government. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Jack. So what I'll do is I'll call out the headings and if members have a, a question or comment on on them, uh, then you can shout at that time. Uh, the first one was the internal realignment of functions. I can confirm that the chief executive did consult me on this and it seems a, a, a highly uh, sensible and beneficial for the employee concerned uh, re realignment. And uh, um, does anybody else have any questions on that one? Uh, Judith. Yes. Yeah, um, I've lost my, my note now. Yes, uh, paragraph nine um, about the functions within transformation and governance being aligned. Mm. I, I just want to raise the issue of this realignment uh, because there is going to be an increased focus on govern governance from next year, um, I, I, I think, in the audit, just to make sure that this all, is all going to be covered off and if any extra work is going to be needed. Okay, so is the question, is it leaving a hole that needs to be plugged? Well, I wouldn't have put it quite like that. But, okay. But is, That's the read. Um, I'm happy to answer, but I see that John's got his hand up and I wondered if um, the Chief Executive might like to Roger. respond. John. Uh, thanks, if I may, Chairman. Uh, I think it's a reasonable question. Uh, th those issues of governance are to the fore of uh, some of the thinking that's being put into uh, the changes that we're taking through at the moment. Um, for various personnel reasons, which it wouldn't be appropriate to discuss in, a, in an open meeting, we've had to move quite quickly on some elements of these changes. And so I, I can't confirm um, exactly what they will be pending some further decisions by the corporate management team and consultation with the senior managers concerned about where they're services will go. There'll be no disruption of the services themselves. It's purely a matter of reporting arrangements. But I think the safest thing I can say to Councillor Grajewski is that um, we are very cognizant of those governance issues. And if anything, I think the outcome to this process will strengthen uh, the, the relationship between uh, monitoring and uh, governance and oversight into the role of the chief executive. But I can confirm that to the committee uh, separately um, uh, after the the decisions are finalised within the management structures, if that's OK, Chairman. Yeah, thank you. Thank, you. thank you. That's reassuring. Thank you. Thank you. Now then, did I see another hand up? OK, that's paragraph 7 through 10 then. Um, the next heading is the national living and minimum wage increases. Anybody have any comments or questions here? 
Uh, Adrian. Yes, um, I'm pleased to see that 23 and 24 year olds are being added to the um, national living wage um, arrangements. Of course, if you're 20, 21 or 22 running your own household, you still need to have uh, a living wage in order to be able to pay your bills. Where we employ people of those sort of age ranges, do they still get the same rates as older people? Yes. So the the um, our lowest uh, paid grade is our grade A, which is already above the national living wage. So right. um, people who are employed in grade A roles will be receiving payment which is above the national living wage payment. Okay. Um, yeah. Right. So it might not be a legal requirement, but we make sure it happens. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Adrian. Any other um, questions on this one? OK, uh, the 2021 pay award. Any questions? I mean, that's a, a summary of the position to date. It looks like there's a lot of discussions that have to take place to narrow the gap between what's being asked for and what may be on offer. Agreed. Yeah. OK. Uh, the next one then is the restriction of public sector exit payments and the lifting of the 95k cap. Any questions or comments here? Uh, well, I'll offer a comment. I'm delighted that that cap is being lifted. I saw it as an anachronism. Uh, Councillor Philpott. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Just a quick, quick question, really. The unintended consequences. Um, are you able to go into a bit more, uh, into a bit more detail, elaborate on, on what you mean by the unintended consequences? Jack. Yes, I'm, I'm just trying to find the paragraph where I uh, reference, if I reference unintended consequences. OK, yeah. Oh, so so it was because um, of a discrepancy between the local government pension scheme uh, regulations and the uh, new regulations. So uh, it wasn't it wasn't possible to honour the regulations of one without breaching the regulations of the other, which would obviously had would have had consequences either from a local government pension scheme perspective or from a uh, government regulation perspective. And it wasn't possible as an employer to not breach those regulations of one or the other and therefore create consequences, which were obviously never intended when the consultation or the uh, cap and the regulations were introduced. So, and there's uh, the, the complexities, I'm sure you can imagine, um, around the local government pension scheme and uh, the regulations is, is significant. So um, that the awareness around unintended consequences was very much to the fore of people, all employers' minds, where they were trying to apply the regulations appropriately and within um, regulations set by government. Steve, is that uh, OK? Um, yes, I think so. Um, I, was, uh, I, I was looking for potentially an example of how un unintended or why they weren't foreseen, really, but that was, and, and indeed also whether it impacted on our business. But that's OK. I, mean, I, I understand. It's, it's a complex matter. Carolyn? Um, yeah, I, I can perhaps help there. So if um, the total cost of exit for an individual breached 95000 the new government regulations required us to only pay £95,000. The local government pension scheme regulations require that anybody being made redundant at age 55 or over is entitled to um, their full unreduced pension. That creates what's called a strain on the fund, which means that the employer releasing that individual pays a sum of money to the pension fund to make good the lack of contributions from the employer and the employee for the period of time that they would normally have been in employment up to retirement age. Those strain in the fund costs can be quite significant depending on the age of the individual leaving and the salary they have um, obtained over their career and also the length of their career. So you could have reached a circumstance whereby an individual leaving 
had a strain on the fund of £150,000 with, let's say, a hypothetical redundancy of £30,000. In that scenario, we would have had to have paid a reduced pension or allowed the individual to defer their pension. We would not have been able to comply with the local government scheme requirement to pay an unreduced pension because the pension cap got in the way of being able to do so. So the interim period of 4th November until this was revoked, we made no redundancy payments that breached the 95k cap. Therefore, we had no need to do any remedial action, thank goodness. But if anybody had, the actions that an employer took during that period would have been to only pay the redundancy payment and allow the individual the choice on their pension. The requirements of the 95k cap were supposedly to then have the employer top up to 95,000 the difference. So if they got 30,000, they would get an extra 65,000 one off lump sum to recompense for not being able to pay the pension strain. Anybody in that particular time period, the employer would not have paid that top up sum of money because there would have been a lack of certainty around what the outcome of any judicial review and subsequent change could have been. And therefore, they could have ended up paying a significant payment, which was not then recoverable, were the outcome to be that we were then to pay an unreduced pension. So the whole thing was incredibly, incredibly complex. And I think I sent a couple of notes to you around um, Council's opinion that we had to seek in order to help us navigate very, very carefully through what would have been a very diff difficult employment matter had we been put in the situation of having to deal with a particular case. So we were, as Jack says, very um, keen that the matter was resolved quickly as it was and um, very reassuring that we didn't have to um, exit anybody at that point in time over 95k. I hope that's helpful in explaining the, the extreme complexities of the situation. It is, thank you. I, I questioned uh, Carolyn and Jack on this uh, and through good fortune, I think, uh, we, we haven't been hit by the law of unintended consequences. So um, we can note this position, I think, without having to worry about whether we have to take any remedial action. I don't think we do. No, so, right. uh, thank you very much, Chairman. And thank you, Carolyn. OK, any other points on this one? Right, we'll move on then to the employment legislation and consultation updates. Any questions or points? I see Adrian's hand. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I was just curious about the measures to address one-sided flexibility consultation. I can understand what one-sided flexibility is, but I wondered about the context of this consultation. What is it they're looking at? So the uh, context, I think we've included in um, previous papers, but in fairly limited um, detail, um, to be fair. Um, I so it, for not no, 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 we did, we haven't. I didn't. I, I was. I'm sort of saying that in, to remind myself as much oh. as anything. What is the, uh, the context? It was genuinely was not a criticism. Um, so it, it's about um, the the you know the what are the steps that we could take from an organisational uh, perspective that would uh, create greater balance in the decision making making around flexibilities in the workplace? So it was consulting on the types of measures that um, could be available to employees or employers to uh, create um, a more balanced perspective of when flexibilities may or may not be appropriate um, for an employee and um, deliverable from an organisational perspective. So at the moment, the emphasis is very much on the um, employer um, both in terms of, you know, the service needs veto all, all other needs from an organisational perspective. And um, it is and it's about balancing that up slightly so that, that an organisation has to be more open to a conversation around what flexibilities are or are not possible. Thank you. Quite a challenging subject. It's but, really uh, tricky, good, really tricky. Yeah, a good one to be pursuing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. Anything else on employment legislation and consultation updates? 
Okay. Um, the shortage occupation list update. Okay, the update on the County Council uh, nationality profile and impact of EU exit. And... Uh, Chairman? Sorry, Adrian. Yes, I, I, just going through my mind, um, where individual employees have difficulties, I, I see we're going to assist them with the, um, trying to get the terminology right, the, the, the citizenship basically or settlement yeah. status. Yeah. Um, where we have, where, where employees have particular problems, will we have the resources available to really help them get this sorted out so that they don't uh, end up just falling foul of, of, of red tape? Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's, um, it's another matter of balance, to be honest. So, so what we're doing is trying to make sure that we are giving uh, our employees all of the information that is available to them to uh, support them in making their applications for settlement um, status. So um, all of the government advice, all of the kind of um, details around helplines and, and uh, all of the questions and answers that are kind of produced nationally to support people. Um, and, you know, where it's practical to offer um, <coughs> support and encouragement to do that, then that, then we are doing that. We're not actively uh, helping people with the application process, which mm. is something which they um, is it kind of is not our role as the employer to no. physically help them with the application process. But what we can do is make sure that they've got all the advice and support that's available to them, that they know where to get it so that they have the best possible chance of completing uh, the, the, the process successfully. So we're doing everything we can while staying on the right side of our role, if you like, as an employer. OK, thank you. Uh, Roy. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. The, the figures say that we've got something like 366 employees is it for, who are EU nationals. Do we have a breakdown of that by departments? That's question one. And question two, do we have any... Inf I, I see on recruitment that uh, the figures almost counterintuitively seem to be holding up against previous year. But uh, what's the position with schools? Uh, do we know whether they've had any uh, difficulty in recruiting staff or do they not need them or whatever, or do we not collect that information? So um, in terms of the breakdown by departments of the staff that we have, then I don't, I don't have it on me, but we, we should be able to get that so I can um, seek to include that in future um, report. I don't think um, you can let me know what it is as well, Peter. Yeah, so. yeah, no, I will do, I will do. Um, in terms of school, I don't, um, I don't, I'm not specifically aware of any particular issues with um, recruitment into schools. Um, we are the, as part of our kind of general day-to-day -day activity as kind of HR uh, support into children's services and specifically into schools, we support around uh, resourcing and recruitment activities. Whilst the decisions are for the schools to make, we obviously um, support in terms of custom and practice, et cetera. And I'm not aware of issues, but again, I can take the question um, offline and seek to get an update from the relevant business partner into schools and come back to you, Councillor Perry. Thank you. I'd be grateful if you would, because I, I just wonder whether there is any organisation, I appreciate there's a, uh, uh, well, uh, I, I would say a confused relationship between uh, schools and uh, the, the local authority in terms of responsibility, but I think somebody somewhere needs to be having an overview of what's happening in Hampshire, and it would be interesting to know whether there's an issue. There may not be at all, but um, uh, I, I certainly welcome the, having the figures. Yeah. I will, I will follow that up. Thank you. And, and just to sort of almost close that one down, I was really pleased to see that, if anything, there's a slight increase in the number of our employees who are EU nationals. Um, are we aware of any strains and pressures that they are facing as a result of EU exit, or is life very much as it was before? So certainly uh, there are no specific issues which are surfacing um, either through um, departmental uh, management teams or through any of our staff networks, for example, which might be a way in which we would um, hear about um, concerns or issues. So I'm not aware of any specifics that I could um, 
connect between the change in status and and um, our employees obviously um, it's something that we are we do pay attention to and we are monitoring so I um, am hopeful that if there were particular issues or thematic issues that were coming up for you know a group of employees specifically that we would um, we would hear about that in a, in order to be able to support and, and address that and I'm not hearing of anything specifically at this time. Well, that's, that's good news. Um, some of us had uh, fears that you wouldn't be able to give that answer a few months in. Yeah. I'm pleased. OK, uh, the, the last paragraph was about consultation and equalities. Um, so I think that takes us to the end of this paper. And the recommendation was that we uh, note the internal realignment of functions increases in the national living and minimum wages and developments concerning the pay awards and legislation. Are we happy to do that, members? Agree. 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 Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. I shall now page down. Bear with me, please, whilst I uh, try and bring up the next one, um, which is the uh, interim uh, workforce report, item seven. Yep. And that's back again. Yeah. So, um, item seven, the paper introduces um, a new interim workforce report covering the period April to September 2020. Uh, the full uh, interim report is included for you in Annex 1 of your papers for consideration. However, I was going to propose that I specifically talk to the covering paper in which I sought to specifically pull out implications of COVID-19 on our workforce. So this is the first year an interim workforce report has been produced and it was timely um, because of the exceptional year our people have lived and worked through. Whilst the uh, paper predominantly focuses on the impact of COVID-19, it also follows up on the response from the organisation um, in relation to our BME network following the death of George Floyd in the United States. As a point of reference, where I refer to the Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic uh, Demographic Group, I will use the term BAME. Um, however, the Hampshire County Council staff network for BAME employees and its allies um, continue to use the term BME through the choice of their membership. So um, I'm pointing that out because it may look like a typing error when actually it's a deliberate uh, naming of their network and their preference. So turning specifically to the report, it's worthy of note that in spite of the unprecedented cir circumstances that befell us in the first half of 2020-21, as an organisation, we have continued to manage services to a high standard and have a reduced head headcount compared to 2010. We continue to have a high performing workforce. We remain focused on good leadership and we have retained our keen focus on the inclusivity of our organisation. Paragraphs 10 through to 15 provide a short overview of key information pertaining to our COVID-19 response for our workforce. There is unashamedly a particular focus here on health and well-being of our staff, which is referred to regularly throughout the report and on which we have been paying close attention throughout the course of the pandemic. Paragraph 11 shows data from August through to December in relation to furlough, with a peak in August of 847 staff furloughed. Of course, we continue to have staff um, on furlough and we keep that under regular review. Um, not referenced in the paper because of the timings, but we had circa 900 staff furloughed during January and February. Paragraph 12 speaks to the significant steps we have taken to ensure people working from home have the equipment they need to do so safely and effectively. This paragraph also shows how our responses to an early staff survey for those predominantly working from home or an office had, um, had a considerable impact by the time we surveyed them again in October. As I've already said, para 14 uh, importantly speaks to the mental health of our workforce, which is something we have been closely monitoring and sought to support from the beginning of the pandemic. You can see that whilst still relatively low, our workforce appear to be tra tracking national trends, whereby the long term nature of the pandemic is having a negative impact on the mental health in general. Paragraph 15 also speaks to key information that has since 
that has since been a focus of line manager and leadership engagement and communication, recognising that regular breaks and informality of working relationships are important to maintain as best as we possibly can during what are incredibly busy times. From here, I'll pick out key COVID-19 impacts in relation to the employee life cycle, which you'll recognise from the annual report that I presented in July last year. So paragraph 16 begins with a tract. The headlines here are that we advertised less roles in the first half of the reporting year than we would have expected based on previous year's figures. In many ways, that is not surprising, particularly when coupled with data that shows that the numbers of leavers from the organisation is also down when compared to the previous year. Also, unsurprisingly, in light of wider labour market conditions, the number of applications received for our roles has increased from an average of 10 applications per role last year to 17 per role in the first half of this financial year. We've seen a slight reduction in the number of female applications received, which may be linked to, a national, uh, to national data stating that over half of women have caring responsibilities. And we're all, of course, recognised that caring has been a considerable feature of life for many during the past year, particularly. We've also seen a decrease in the number of people declaring a disability applying for our roles. Again, this is perhaps unsurprising considering what we know about the virus and the shielding population. It goes without saying that this is an area where we'll monitor closely to ensure that we encourage this portion of the labour market back to roles in Hampshire County Council when it is safe for them to do so. Um, we work with our disability network and our new carers and working families networks on initiatives in these spaces. We've seen an increase in applications received from those aged 20 to 34, particularly in grade C to E. This again potentially can be linked to wider reports of the impact that the pandemic has had and continues to have on this particular demographic. Equally, it may be linked to the nature of the roles that we advertise at this grade, with the wider impacts on the hospitality and retail sector, for example, if you um, compare the two, um, you can see a connection. At paragraph 21, we turn to resource. So our agency, Connect to Hampshire, continues to play a fundamental role in the resourcing of our roles. And we've seen an increase in demand for qualified social working and administrative workers. Equally, we've seen an increase in the number of people registering with the agency and have noted a higher quality of applications during the first half of the reporting year. I should note that paragraph 24 contains an editorial note that should have been removed before the paper was uh, published. On the onboarding <laughs> section, uh, and I can say that we did confirm that it was linked to COVID, so the note should have been removed. Uh, the onboarding section is that begins in paragraph 26. We know that this has been particularly challenging during the pandemic, particularly when we would ordinarily place such an importance on enabling new staff to meet colleagues and team members and spend time with them learning about their role. We don't have specific data to support any assertions we make in this section, but we do know that anecdotally both staff, new staff and line managers have found the welcoming and inducting of people particularly dif difficult when doing so virtually. We've supported staff and managers where we can and encourage people to spend the time they need on the important activities, um, even more so um, during this time when it's perhaps even more difficult for them to do so. But actually, that makes it even more important that they invest the time in those uh, in that sort of relationship building. Paragraphs 27 to 40 cover develop this um, We've brought forward the launch of Microsoft Teams to support and enable people to work from home. And that was an early feature of our development schedule for staff in the first half of the reporting year. The software has meant that not only can staff undertake their roles effectively, but also that we continue to develop them and also provide wellbeing support to them too. So we're using the medium in all sorts of ways to improve relationships and support staff in their work. Um, we've updated much of our face-to-face -face learning content to be virtual classrooms um, in order to continue to support learning and where possible we've also um, increased our development of e-learning um, to enable learning to continue when we can't bring people together in the same circumstances. We've provided extensive wellbeing support and information to people through specifically created wellbeing pages on our intranet. Colleagues from across Ham from HR, public health and occupational health have worked together to create and maintain these. They cover a wide range of subjects and are kept updated, supported through an active comms and engagement plan and are well used. Um, 
I've included a screenshot of the front pages of those um, sites for your information as an appendix to the paper. Another key feature of development during the first half of 2020-21 has been a new initiative which we've devised with our BME network called Let's Talk Race. The purpose of these workshops can be seen in paragraph 33 and they've been well tended and feedback has been excellent. We're currently looking at further evaluation of these interventions with a view to report reporting to the Inclusion, Diversity and Wellbeing Steering Group later in March on the impact and possible next steps. Uh, paragraph 36 also explains that we're in the progress process of reviewing our inclusion and diversity strategy for the organisation, which will further enable us to review our work plan and related policies. The work is still in progress, um, but we've had a great involvement from staff across the organisation in, in that work, who, and people are generally eager to learn more about um, inclusivity and how they can continue to make things better for themselves and for their colleagues. Our leadership programmes, Firefly and TLP, paused during the first lockdown, but have since been converted to virtual delivery and are now progressing. And our Hampshire Managers leaders net Leadership Network has continued to meet virtually throughout the pandemic. As you know, apprenticeships are a key part of our development toolkit and COVID-19 has sadly impacted by preventing the usual programme development and promotional activities. By mid-December, we expected to have circa 100 new apprenticeship starts, which is some 55% lower than the same period in the previous year. That said, those apprenticeships that were already in progress at the beginning of the pandemic have been able to continue, which is a testament not just to the individuals, but the various managers and teams that support those, those programmes. The reward and recognise section reflects... Um, as we all know that thank you has become a phrase delivered with even more meaning now um, than pre-pandemic and continues to be experienced so powerfully by our staff group. The positive response to the leader's message of thanks earlier in the year is just one example of this. Um, there continue to be many stories of excellent performance in difficult circumstances and we're currently considering how to formally recognise the contributes of, contributions of our staff once we find ourselves in brighter days, which we're hopefully now on the horizon. Um, Special recognition payments remain one of the ways in which we've rewarded and recognised um, staff with more payments made in the first half of the year than normal, most of which were made uh, for uh, frontline care roles in adults, health and care to recognise the additional duties that people were being asked to undertake. Paragraphs 44 through to 52 speak to pro progress and perform. And um, again, the contributions of our staff are worthy of note in this section. Performance has continued to be strong across the council, which is likely linked to the fact that we have always focused organisationally on outcomes as opposed to attendance or presenteeism. And therefore, whether we're working virtually or in offices or care homes, for example, the focus has stayed the same. More practically, we have deployed a redesignation scheme to support departments to continue to perform through the redeployment of staff where necessary. Um, whilst only small numbers of staff were eligible for redeployment due to specific skills and capabilities required, where placements were made, they were warmly received by managers and staff. And this, the, seam skis, the seam ceased during the first, after the first lockdown, but has since been temporarily reinstated, and we'll keep that under review. Um, another measure that's been key to enabling staff to continue to perform has been the COVID-19 self-assessment tool that we introduced to enable staff and managers to appropriately understand the risks they might be facing and to better enable a constructive conversation that might otherwise have been difficult to facilitate. This has been welcomed across the board, but particularly by our BAME colleagues who have been understandably worried about the reported disproportionate impact of the virus on them. Likewise, other vulnerable staff have reported the helpfulness of the tool in enabling constructive conversations. Unsurprisingly, perhaps we've seen less performance and misconduct cases raised during the first half of the reporting year. We think largely linked to the new working arrangements, but also um, perhaps to the increased working volume of managers. Um, of the 43 misconduct cases we have seen in the first half of the year, only two specifically related to COVID-19. Both were in relation to um, personal protective equipment. We have seen a higher level of absence, particularly attributed to isolation, isolating non-working amongst female staff, more so than male. We think this is due to a combination of the following factors. So 
some of it will be to do with staff who are clinically extremely vulnerable um, in roles where it's not possible for them to work from home and therefore they've had to self-isolate because uh, because of their own circumstances or perhaps because of family um, circumstances and caring responsibilities. We also see, we've also seen 19 new resolving workplace issues cases uh, arise during the first half of the year. However, only one of those specifically linked to COVID-19. And then finally, um, in the retain and exit section, um, which I alluded to earlier, we've seen less levers in the first half of the year, um, which um, compared to the previous year, which is perhaps not surprising, continuing what we, considering what we know about the wider um, labour market. And before I hand over for, for back to the um, chairman, I just wanted to note that there is an the, on page 38 of your pack, there's a table at 3.8, uh, which incorrectly um, identifies the term FTE as full-time employees when actually it means full-time equivalent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jack. Um, what I'll do, members, is I'll go back up to the, the top and uh, just call out the headings and see if anybody has any questions or comments. So we started off with context and the executive summary, and uh, then we went into attract, getting new staff in. And my question, Jack, is an interesting one, um, uh, point that you raised, that we used to get 10 applications per role and we're now getting 17, which is a yep. significant increase. Yep. And is that a proportionate, no, exactly proportionate to the increase in unemployment? Or is there a qualitative thing here that Hampshire is seen as a safe place to work and people want to come in at a time of uh, uh, high difficulty nationally? Um, to be honest, I don't. I haven't looked. We haven't um, explored the rationale behind that in in more detail. Um, so I. I would be, I don't know that it's kind of directly proportionate to the uh, impact on the wider, um, on the wider labour market. My, my guess, and it is a guess, would be that it's a mixture of both. We, were, we are likely to be seen as not just a safe employer, but a large, therefore potentially secure future employer over, over the coming, over the coming years. So for people who are looking for roles, um, they maybe are considering local government in a way that they may not have considered local government previously. But as I say, I don't have, um, at this point in time, I don't have data to support that. That would be a kind of logical assumption that I think we could make. Yes. Well, I ask it in the context of future recruitment because yeah. if we have a unique selling point, as it were, yeah. Uh, yeah. then we'd want to ex exploit it in the future. Yeah, and we're certainly... Um, talking about how do we um, demonstrate to people who are applying for roles in the future the uh, resources that are available to people. So, you know, the stuff that we've done in the wellbeing space, for example, which is largely just signposting, but actually has been really, really well received by people. Um, and it's it's quite hard to, to find that stuff out for yourself, whereas as an employee of the council, you can quite simply get access to that information. Um, so we do think that those kind of things will be a feature of our employee offer, if you like, in the future. Thank you. Roy is leaning forward as if he'd like to contribute. Well, uh, really just a, an anecdote, Mr Chairman. My, my granddaughter, who graduated from Bristol last year, and I thought had always held local government in total contempt, said <laughs> to me, yeah, do you think there's anything of at Hampshire County Council, I could apply to do it. So I said no to her, but um, uh, it, it certainly alerted me that people who previously hadn't been thinking about local government were suddenly thinking, here, yeah, this isn't such a bad idea. I don't know whether she's a player, I very much doubt it. And that's an interesting anecdote. It, it's basically illustrating the point I was uh, trying yep. to draw out. Now, I see a hand that has gone up. Um, it, oh, it's the Chief Executive. John. Just to confirm, Chairman, that the County Council will welcome with open arms any interest from any high-flying graduates, so tell her to give us a shout. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. You didn't listen. Yeah. Okay. So, um, resource. Anything on resource members? 
I see another hand up. Uh, oh, John, is that a legacy hand? It's, I think that was a legacy hand. So if we have dealt with resource uh, onboarding. I think Councillor Huxtep. Councillor Perry, boy. No, legacy hand, I think. No, uh, Mr. Chairman, I did put my hand up gotcha. for the, the, yep. the previous heading uh, on uh, what do we call it? Um, resource. At, uh, resource. That was it. At paragraph twenty-three. Uh, use of English. Uh, th th this is a meeting in public, so there will be people looking at this. I'd like to see the word less change to fewer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Chairman, if my wife had seen the report, she would say exactly the same. <laughs> Very elegant, Roger. You're going out with a bang. <laughs> OK, so on board. Chairman, I, I did miss a point. Sorry, I'm really, really sorry taking you back on the first section on attract. And it was on paragraph 20, if you just... Um, um, tolerate me for a moment. It's the point yes. about the slight reduction in the number of applications received from people declaring a disability. And, and I do understand the uh, where people have conditions that might be considered a disability, that um, this is something that's not surprising. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm assuming it's something we'll keep a very close eye on yeah, because we absolutely. have made good progress in the last few years and we would yeah. want to continue doing so. Yeah, no. No, absolutely. Which is why um, we've all, in fact, we've already got some meetings um, in arranged with our disability network and also our um, carers and working families networks. Um, because um, I think in the annual workforce report, we recognise that the employment of people who are um, declaring a disability and also, um, yeah, so specifically people declaring a disability was an area that we wanted to maintain the same focus on. So I think we just have to, you know, we have to kind of redouble our efforts, really, because we, we may um, have work to do to help people to understand that the working environment is safe and and secure um, in, in ways they might not understand. So we will, we absolutely will keep a, a, a close a close eye on it. And okay, thank you. you. The other side thank you for that. So, sorry, sorry, Adrian. Hey, no, you, just say thank you for your indulgence, Chairman. No, no problem. The, the, the other side of that answer, Jack, is that with an, if there's an increasing preponderance of working from home and that becomes part of life after COVID, it might make working for Hampshire more attractive for people with physical disabilities uh, and yeah. difficulties of coming in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ab absolutely. And we're, and we're just actually looking at um, our adverts, actually, and, and where we, the point in our adverts, which we flag up to people that we're an organisation that is prepared to consider flexibilities and alternative um, arrangements. At, at, at the moment, that's something that we that we put on our adverts right at the end of the advert. It might seem like a, like a, a, a small point, but actually... If you knew that up front, it might change the frame with which you review the advert and, you know, you might, you know, the way that you think about whether or not the role might be for you or not. So we're just looking at all sorts of things to see how we can make small steps to keep attracting people who uh, might otherwise be talking themselves out. Yes, that will be a very interesting analysis. I'd be interested yep. in that one. Yep. All right. Thank you for bringing that up, Adrian. Um, so resource and then onboarding. See no hands, okay. Uh, development. Okay. Uh, reward and recognize. Okay. Uh, progress and perform. Retain and exit. One of the, the general points that I, I thought just might be worth a mention is that I'm full of praise for our IT department in the way in which Teams was introduced. And we took up meetings like this extremely yeah. quickly. 
so that's not just a, a question of uh, they did the job, the technology worked, which it did, but the boldness of the implementation yep. forced on us, but nevertheless bold, uh, was uh, important and it was successful. And perhaps yep. that's um, something that we could bear in mind for future um, technology projects. Yeah. No, and, and also I think yeah, there's another um, part of that. Um, which, so I completely agree with what you've said. And and then I think there's a wonderful story here around the way that we've listened to people as well. So then when people um, thanked us for the technology but started to voice other needs they had in the equipment, in the equipment space to support them to use their technology more effectively at home, like being able to have a large screen or collect an office chair, the fact that we can we can evidence that we asked people what they needed and then were able to provide what they needed, I think is a really, really great story for us as, as, as an organization um, and something that I think we should be really, really proud of because it, it, it logistically was very difficult and yet we did it seemingly uh, very easily. Thank you. I've started something. I've got Roger's hand and then Adrian. Roger. Yes, I, I would like to echo the uh, congratulations to the, the IT department. I think they've been uh, absolutely magnificent and that their helpline personnel are first class. But Brilliant. that wasn't why I put my hand up, actually. Okay. Uh, that came as, a, as an afterthought. Um, I would like to think that when we use Black Lives Matter, either in print or in word, we subconsciously think all lives matter. And that should be, a, I think, a collective um, matter of conscience for everyone in the County Council. So we've, we've, um, we've talked about this organisationally, actually. Uh, in fact, the Chief Executive has um, issued a couple of uh, notices to staff that um, that kind of seek to speak to to this point. And I think the point that we've been trying to, um, and very successfully actually have um, communicated to, to the workforce is that the, the, I, uh, my personal view is that the, the Black Lives Matters movement is absolutely enforcing the view that all lives matter. What we're saying is that right at the moment, that there was a, at, at that, this moment in time, there is a, a need to pay particular attention to um, the lives of our, of our colleagues, fellow citizens who are black. Um, not to say that all other lives don't matter, but right at this moment, um, th there's a need for us to pay some attention to them. There's a really lovely um, uh, uh, cartoon, if you like, can't think of the, of the phrase imagery of um, uh, somebody's a house on fire. And then somebody's, ha somebody's the next door neighbor's house is not on fire, and the the point of the of the um, cartoon is that both houses are important, but the one that's on fire right at the moment needs all of our attention so that we can put the fire out. It doesn't make the other person's house any less important to them or to anyone else, but actually the one on fire is where we need to uh, point our hoses at, at the moment, which is which has really helped us land the message. And the Let's Talk Race workshops have really enabled us to kind of get into a conversation about that organisationally, when sometimes we previously we may have been afraid to talk about that, but we've been able to kind of get into that as a conversation. So it's been really positive. Uh, thank, thank you, Jack. I understand that completely. Uh, and that's why I use the word subconsciously. In other words, whenever we use Black Lives Matter, we're, we're thinking all yeah. lives matter. Thank you. Thank you. Adrian. Yes, thank you, Chairman. On that last point, thank you for that answer, Jack. It was a really good answer. And uh, in answer to Roger's point, he's absolutely right, of course. And whenever I see the phrase Black Lives Matter, I always think as well. And that that's the context of this, um, that, you know, that Black Lives Matter, I think, are trying to get over. Um, and I would certainly agree with the comments about IT rolling out um, uh, the ability to uh, conduct teams meetings. That was a phenomenal exercise and carried out very quickly and, and efficiently. Um, Chairman, I just wanted to make a general comment and I made it at the last meeting, but I, I think it warrants repeating again, which is this layout of the report, the, the, the workforce report, I find so logical and so useful for setting the various things we're looking at into a logical context. 
and I really welcome it and I'm, I'm glad it's being used again and will continue to be used because I think it, 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 it's, it's very, very helpful. And the only other comment I would make, Chairman, reading all this, quite rightly talking about providing what we need uh, for our staff to be able to work efficiently and healthily at home. Uh, I'm reminded of the fact that I'm sitting on a stool with a pile of cushions because the state of my back after crouching over a laptop for the last year uh, has, has caused some issues. Uh, thankfully, they are receding now, but uh, these things matter. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, well, to con so that Jack doesn't have to answer this, uh, that the point that you made, I, I think that uh, the new format of the report was Jack stamping her mark on uh, this position, and it's been very well received. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carter, Chris. Thank you, uh, thank you, Chairman. Well, yes, I, I, I'd very much like to uh, join in the congratulations to all the staff, and, and I'm, I, I fully support the analogy of a, of a fire. Um, but um, I'd, I'd be interested to know um, how um, appraisal is, is working. We, we've been working now for the best part of a year um, um, with so many staff at home. Um, and I think I read in the report there's a toolkit for, for managers. But it, it can't be easy for managers to, to, to be seeking to assess their staff. So um, have, have staff been able to be promoted um, during the during the last year and how, how has appraisal during this last year um, compared with um, previous uh, yeah. years when we, we we weren't in this situation yeah I think <clears throat> I think we're largely helped by the fact that um, organizationally um, I mean I haven't been around for lots and lots of years but it's very clear from when I got here that that, that, that there is a very obvious and intentional focus on outcomes and um, and delivery and outputs and service um, and service delivery and so that fo because that I think that's helped us because that focus has not changed and those things we can still uh, monitor and measure we know when people are delivering the outcomes that they are um, asked to deliver through their role it's still possible for managers and leaders to see that work is being delivered in 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 the way that it was previously I think if we had been more of a culture where our um, assessment of performance was was more based on you know seeing people do their work it would have been much more difficult but because we base it on the outcomes and what is delivered we can still see that um, in in action so that's helped I think what we what we've learned is so managers are continuing to have one-to-ones in the way that they always would have had um, previously albeit that they are virtual one-to-ones mm -hmm. rather than in, in in a room together we, we know, um, and the reason why we created the toolkits, because we, we know that managers were not having an issue um, having regular one-to-ones. They didn't have an issue having regular one-to-ones when everything was going well. They were finding it slightly more difficult to have the more challenging conversations virtually than yeah. they would have done in a room. So the, the toolkits were around helping with that. And we've also just introduced um, some new... Uh, learning around uh, managing remote teams which kind of further develops the differences and how you use your emotional intelligence and the you know, you know all the clues that you might normally spot from someone's body language and, yeah. and, and so on you know how do you pick some of that up virtually and on the back of that um, development what we've also now done is set up what we're calling action learning sets but basically a space for managers to come together in small groups to specifically talk about some of the challenges they're having and get feedback from other managers about how they've overcome them because some of this you can't really teach in a in a kind of formal intervention it's about actually sharing each other's experience and what's worked personalities and, and how yes. people relate to one another yes yeah. yes so, yeah. we're, so we're, we're experimenting with all sorts of ways of enabling managers, but, but in terms of the process of appraisal, if you like, that has continued as normal. Um, and we've just provided extra support to managers to do that as well as they possibly can um, virtually. Yeah, well, that's, that's very useful to know. Um, thank, thank you very much for that explanation. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Members, have we asked our questions on this report? Because if so, we are asked to note the content of the report in Annex 1, review the specific implications uh, for COVID-19, 
presented in this covering paper and note the progress in relation to the actions and next steps. Are we content so to do? Yep. Agreed. Great, thank you. So that was the interim workplace report. The next one is the open workplace policy. And uh, is this you again, Jack? It is indeed. <clears throat> So the paper that the committee have in front of them is seeking your agreement to implement a new open workplace policy for our staff. As has already been referenced uh, in the meeting, our staff have responded excellently during the pandemic and have continued to perform effectively, deliver services regardless of whether they're working in the workplace or at home. And to that end, we want to continue to maximize, maximize the benefits of flexible working that we've demonstrated over the past 12 months. The committee is asked to agree that we implement the policy which is attached in your papers and delegate the authority to the Director of Corporate Resources to make any final amendments to the policy following agreed consultation with the trade unions and in relation to on any ongoing amendments that arise from the future application of the policy. So in terms of the context, the proposed paper follows on from our experiences during the past year and our new ways of working imposed through the early days of lockdown in March 2020. Clearly, we want to continue to provide modern, efficient and effective, productive ways of working to better support the needs of the service and members of staff. We expect there will be a permanent shift in the use of corporate accommodation as we begin to return from the lockdown, but with a different configuration and use of workspaces that reflects the best of remote working and hybrid arrangements. Paragraph 8 sets out the organisational benefits of this proposed policy, which includes productivity, um, optimisation of our investment in IT equipment, improved attraction for future employees and greater flexibility of the work force. And paragraph nine likewise um, sets out the benefits that we anticipate for staff, such as improved health and well-being, better work-life balance, reduced travel costs, etc. We know that our staff will welcome new ways of working and increased flexibilities, and we've already, already significantly invested in enabling, in enabling staff to work effectively from alternative locations, as we've already discussed. The EHCC 2007 collective agreement includes a working from home allowance to be paid to eligible employees who are contractually working from home. These members of staff would continue to be eligible to receive the allowance, the allowance under this new policy. The open working policy would not result in all members of staff who are temporarily working from home due to COVID restrictions or who opt to work at home in the future becoming eligible for that working from home allowance as they are not contractually required to do so. In the future, most staff will, due to their role, continue to be required to work from their designated workplace or some other council premises for all or part of the time to carry out their role effectively. Many staff, however, have roles that can be carried out effectively when undertaken from home or some other location as agreed by their line manager. Do you want me to pause now, Councillor Collett, or shall I? No, no, please carry on. Okay. There are a couple of general questions when you okay. finish. Thank yes. you. So the principles of the new policy are set out in paragraph 16. Work takes place at the most effective location at the most appropriate time, with the needs of the service determined by managers. The service will determine where roles should be carried out. There are benefits for staff in attending the workplace to carry out activities that can be equally well carried out remotely. Within the needs of the service, staff can opt to carry out their work at or from their preferred workplace. We'd seek to maximise our investment in technology. Flexible working relies on a culture of mutual understanding, trust and respect. Performance is, is results focused and measured through the achievement of outputs and objectives. Regular comms and a focus on health and well-being will be essential. Subject to the committee's approval, the open workplace policy will, um, will be taken by HR and to, in order to engage with our trade union representatives at a joint uh, cons consultative group on the 17th of March. Minor adjustments will be subject to agreement by the Director of Corporate Resources, but we expect our trade unions to welcome the modern working practices and increase flexibility for staff members. The new policy will be implemented following the completion of consultation with the trade unions, and it is expected that we would be able to implement in April 2021. 
um, further manager and employee guidance would be created by HR to support its implementation implementation in the future. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Adrian. Do you want to kick off? Yeah. Yes, I had two questions. Um, not in any way disagreeing with anything that's in the report. Is there likely to be an issue from staff who need to travel into our uh, offices or other premises to work and thereby have to bear the costs of doing so when they see other staff who aren't having to bear their costs and are working from home and getting a home allowance paid um, to cover equipment and whatever else. It seems to me that there's a, a danger there of a division between staff. Yeah. So I think I think um, what's important here will be how we communicate these um, these changes. So um, there currently is and there would continue to be a very separate set of arrangements for someone who is contractually working from home. So the people who uh, contractually work from home are people who, from the offset, do not have an office base. So their role does not require them to have an office base and they do their work solely um, um, from, from <coughs> home. And any travel that they undertake is, um, in, the, is in the spirit of their, of their job and is generally not to one of our official office spaces. So those are people who are contractually working from home and that wouldn't change in the future. This policy is all about the people who we're saying um, contractually, actually they have an office base. They have a place of work, which is uh, their formal office base. But we're saying that at the discretion of the service and uh, the line manager, they can agree to work more flexibly. So not having to come to that office every day if the work is pertinent and the services um, can still be delivered. So I think we'll just have to be very clear about what's the difference mm -hmm. of somebody who is um, contractually working from home versus somebody who has formerly an office base, but which can choose to ask for some flexibility in how that they deliver mm -hmm. their role. Okay, thank you. Clearly an important area of work that yeah. needs careful monitoring and... Yeah. and Oh, yeah. my, my other question, Chairman, was a lot more mundane, and that is that experience as a councillor, um, where people are working from home, and I support that, I, I, I welcome it, I think what, what, what we're doing is, is absolutely the right thing to do, um, the frustration that you can't just pick up a phone and ring someone because they're not in the office, and obviously we can't have their home numbers, is there a telephony solution that can be um, implemented to overcome that problem? Sometimes just picking up the phone and a two minute conversation with someone can save hours and hours of emailing backwards and forth and be yeah. the sensible way forward. I use Teams I... for most of the people that I want to talk to with the advantage that it tells you if they're available. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's true. Yeah. But so, top so is you... that means getting out the hybrid and plugging yeah. it in and all the rest of it when all you want to do is make a quick phone call. <laughs> Yeah. So, the, so the expectation is that teams would be the medium for for um, or yeah. doing that. OK, no, that's useful. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I now have councillors Grovsky, Perry and Huckstep. So let's take Judith first and then keep. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Um, first of all, can, can I just preface what I'm going to say by saying I do understand that some people do like working from home or as I like to call it, sleeping at the office. Um, but. Are, does everybody want to work from home? And if we employ people and there is a contract, contractual agreement for them to work from home, is that going to put some people off? Not everybody has the space to do no. it. Now, I, I tripped over my wire again this morning. And yeah. I'm going to do myself a mischief soon. Um, yeah. And um, also, um, how, how much uh, is this payment uh, to eligible employees because I'm sure that uh, everybody's noticed that their utility bills have, uh, have gone up um, uh, even if they're they're saving a bit on, on, on petrol but not everybody drives to work I know people um, uh, in Winchester who uh, staff who walk to work or cycle to work so yeah. um, you know are they being fully recompensed and um, should it be a, a contractual requirement so um, I probably haven't been clear um, 
councillor. So we're, the, pap the open working policy is not proposing that we would any everyone would have a contractual requirement to work from home, or that we would seek to only employ people on a working from home contractual requirement basis in the future. So the people, for the, for the vast majority of people who are currently office based, their contract contract won't change. We only issue a contract for working from home where the role determines it. It's not determined by the individual. So, um, so it's not that we wish to convert everyone to contractually being required to work at home because we know not everybody will want to and we know that it's not possible for everybody to. So that, that isn't part of the plan. And the vast majority of people currently have a base, which is one of our offices, and they will continue to have a base, which is one of our offices. Um, or what this policy is doing is making it easier for the individual to say, I'd quite like to work more flexibly, please. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, for us to have a means of enabling that, whereas at the moment, um, the flexible working tends to be to follow a very formal um, route, which is um, only easily available to certain groups of staff based on protections in law. And this is saying that we would be more open to considering it more broadly as, a, as an organisation subject to service needs. Um, and uh, the allowance of the allowance is, I'm just trying to remember, the home working allowance is £700 per pro rata. Per annum pro rata. Not, not inconsiderable. No, thank you. Okay, I saw the chief executive's hand go up and come down, which I suspect might mean that you gave the right answer, Jack, but I don't know if John did want to come in. Um, it, uh, thank you, Chairman. And Jack always gives the right answer. Um, <laughs> but it's just, an, it's just an additional point on the telephony that. Uh, the vast majority of staff have got access to Hampshire County Council mobile phones and those that you work with more routinely will 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 share those numbers with you if you need to contact them other than through teams that's all thank you thank you right I, I've now got a number of hands so I'll take uh, Councillor Perry followed by Councillor Huckstep then Councillor House and then Councillor Carter Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Just one comment, really, on the wording in the report. I mean, clearly, the and I think it says in seven that the council aims to have a modern approach to working. I, I just raised my eyebrows where we said we were going to take a more modern approach, the implication being that maybe our previous practices have been rather old-fashioned. I don't think that was the case. We're just regularly keeping it up to date. So I... Um, I had images of the town clerk in Dad's army when it sort of how local government used to exist. But I think perhaps we should pay some sort of tribute to Councillor Colin Davidovitz, who was the um, councillor who really pushed for us to get uh, web streaming of, of our um, meetings. And at the time, there was some question whether that was necessary. But now we're seeing that having got used to that sort of uh, procedure, it helps us at meetings and clearly helps in the organisation of things. So he was definitely uh, forward thinking in that yeah. respect. The only other question I wanted to ask, is, it's all very well for people to have the correct equipment in their homes. Have we experienced any problems with members of staff not having good broadband connectivity in parts of Hampshire? Or can we now pat ourselves on the back and say that everywhere has got uh, excellent broadband and there are no problems in that respect? I confess I don't technically know whether everyone in Hampshire has good broadband uh, connectivity. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that they probably don't because there will be quite rural areas, and um, I, don't, I, I genuinely, I genuinely don't, I don't know. Um, I think there are. I know Carolyn's got a hand up. She's probably going to save me because she's better at the uh, technical responses than, than than I am. Save me, Carolyn. Councillor Perry, it was just to say, as you would imagine, there are still small pockets across Hampshire that don't uh, enjoy the, the highest standard of broadband. Clearly, during the national lockdown, there's little we could do about that other than be understanding of um, some of the limitations that placed on staff. There are ways around it that staff have been able to achieve, like switching off their video um, and switching off the video in as well as out and plugging directly into their um, router. Clearly, once we go back to a situation whereby staff can access the offices, and again, this plays to Councillor Grzeski's point that 
staff are welcome to come back and work in the office five days a week. This open workplace policy, as Jack said, is about opening up the opportunity of not having to do that. Therefore, if staff cannot um, work effectively because of broadband issues, then they are more than welcome once we're allowed to, to come back to the office and to avoid those um, minor frustrations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, I think it's uh, Roger now. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, Jack, can you give us any examples of what these uh, contractual home workers actually do? Yes, uh, so uh, governors, uh, clerks is one example. Uh, so clerks to governors are um, contractually home workers. I'm um, just, I've got some notes, just one second. Um, so we have... Um, circa 140 so there's about 140 um clerks to governing bodies um so these are schools based um so roles that are linked into schools and we also have um so the hampshire inspection and Envi advisory service again linked to schools have about 60 people who are on um contractual home working policies as as two examples Thank you. It, it, it's clear, therefore, whether a particular role should be uh, a home-based contractual uh, job yes. or not. And, and, yes. and that's good. Grey areas would be difficult to manage. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Roger. Uh, Council House, Keith. Thanks so much, Stephen. I think this is, a, this is all about imagining a different way of being, really, isn't it? Some of which we've already experienced and some of which we'll will gradually work towards. The critical point really is that this is a mutual benefit. It's yeah. to help the staff and it's to help the council. And if it doesn't do either of those, or it only does one of those, then it isn't working. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure it can be made to work. I think the critical thing is, is really about flexibility. I suspect that we'll see for most organisations, and we're already, already living this, um, many staff working sometimes from home, sometimes from the office, sometimes from somewhere else entirely different, uh, because yeah. that, fits in, that will fit in with their lifestyle. And as long as that's managed in a sensible way, taking account of things like security that's been mentioned, uh, then, then all well and good. That helps our work-life balance, it helps our quality of life, it helps our mental well-being, and on and on and on, and certainly it improves productivity. I'll just use a couple of examples. Um, I, 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 I was listening to a seminar a couple of days ago. It wasn't a seminar where I needed to see the screen. It wasn't a seminar where I needed to speak. I was basically listening. I did it while out for a walk in the park because it was yep. easier for me and it fits and it goes some exercise at the same time rather than just sat in front of this damned infernal machine all the time uh, another time uh, back last september uh, i was t i took a few days leave with my partner uh, councillor craig we were in malta and i did a team's briefing it's not a public meeting but a team's briefing uh, whilst there and it worked it fitted and it meant i didn't miss anything but equally uh, i wasn't really losing any quality time i was exhausted after a day out uh, so yep. all these things can be made to work I think one of the critical points is we'll need to just be to, to, to learn from how it goes. Yeah. Um, and what's written down now probably won't be right in a year's time. It might not even be right in six months' time. Um, yeah. Some people will end up working more from office, more from home, more from somewhere else, uh, and that's all fine too. I think the other bit is the human side, which we need to think about the downsides. Uh, I'm, for me, it's perfect. Uh, I can sit here quite happily chatting away to you all. Um, I haven't got children running around in the background. I haven't got dogs barking, cats pawing me or whatever it is cats do uh, and anything like that um uh, i'm just quietly here by myself having a nice chat with my friends um well mostly um no all of you really um uh, and that's and that's that's good uh, and that's that, that certainly helps but it's not like that for everybody and if people are in cramped accommodation they've got young kids screaming they've got an elderly parent with dementia all these kind of things we just need to think about how that fits too so yeah. i i think we should look look at this positively but the critical point is going to be the quality of management yeah. Uh, and making sure those relationships between staff and their managers uh, work really well. So I, I embrace this. Uh, let's go with it uh, and let's see how we can keep getting better. Thank you. Excellent. I wonder, Jack, um, I think he said something quite important at the beginning of his uh, offering that. And, and that is that um, there's a mutuality here of benefit uh, with yeah. um, we benefit if people are working efficiently and uh, conveniently and the employees do as well i wonder if it would be worth capturing that thought in part of the preamble uh, because i think it's 
it helps uh, to frame everything that follows. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Councillor Carter, Chris. Oh, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, well, I fully support um, the, this, this proposal and support the recommendation. Um, it will, I'm sure, be reviewed on a, a very regular basis because technology is moving at such a pace and, and adapting. I, j I just wanted to make a small point about um, um, paragraph 12 in the policy about insurance. Uh, it is the responsibility of a member of staff to inform the insurance provider, mortgage lender or landlord. Well, um, I, I would perhaps suggest that um, the staff should provide confirmation that they fulfilled that requirement because the insurance companies are notoriously um, um, liable to um, uh, excuse themselves from their responsibility because they haven't been informed about something. Heaven forbid that there was a fire on a, a piece of county council equipment that was supplied supplied to a member of staff, and I could I could if there was a fire and an insurance company excused their liability, I could envisage um, a problem there. So I would suggest that staff should provide confirmation that they've ensured that they have advised their insurance companies. Thank you, Chairman. Interesting point. Uh, I see Carolyn wants to come in on that. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Carter, rest assured the County Council ensures all of the equipment that it has provided to staff. So if anything were to happen to the County Council's equipment, then our own insurance policies would cover that. The point that's being referenced there is um, employees working from home should open up a dialogue with their insurance company to make sure that their insurance company understands the times that they're working at home and not at home because that can affect the cost of their um, home contents and home buildings insurance so it's simply about reminding staff of good practice i know during the pandemic um, many insurance companies have already communicated that they accept that many people are working from home and therefore they are still covered without making contact um, but certainly procedurally we do not gather evidence of insurance cover we may make it clear to employees that it is their requirement and if they fail to do so then um, actions follow thereafter but our equipment is not at risk thank you I, I, I don't think I was really referring to the equipment I was referring to the, to the equipment burning the house down um, but but if we're um, content that um, it is the staff's responsibility well so be it Councillor Carter, my apologies. Our, our equipment um, is obviously um, properly checked before yeah. it's allocated out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Judith. Yes, yeah, just something that's come to me while I've been listening to uh, the discussion. Um, I recall someone a few years ago, and I can't remember whether he worked for a building society or a bank, um, but um, he uh, would occasionally take work home in the evening on his um, la laptop or what, whatever it was in those days. And the company, uh, because it held personal data on there or access to personal data, uh, he was required <laughs> he was required to chain it to the to, to the radiator when he wasn't using it. Um, do, do we <laughs> do we ask people to do anything similar? And, and what are the risks? Um, we do not. Um, have those risks anymore. Obviously, the, the hybrids and the laptop devices that we are using do not store, we are not allowed to store um, data on them. Everything is stored virtually in the cloud, in our data centres, etc. So everything that we are working on is not on our devices um, and we're not allowed to put data onto sticks and put that onto the device itself. So everything is very, very secure in that regard. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, that's been a, a, a significant discussion, I think. And uh, I've uh, been through all the hands that have been put up. We're invited to agree that the council implements an open workplace policy as attached as Appendix A to this paper. That's probably based on Appendix A to this paper because we have made a few uh, suggestions. Um, and that uh, we delegate to the Director of Corporate Resources the authority to make any final amendments to it 
uh, that are agreed following consultation with the trade union representatives and any ongoing amendments that arise from the future application of this policy. Um, a point I always make uh, at this point, that our trade unions represent about 20% of our staff and they are obvious uh, consultees. Um, who will speak for the other 80? So we'll we'll do our usual um, you know engagement around uh, the changes. We've also over the pandemic period been doing regular staff surveys. So we also have a sense of um, we could we go into this with a degree of confidence based on the responses we've had from our staff surveys that this is something that staff would welcome going forward because we have asked questions that are pertinent to how people might see the future as well as their current um, experience, such as how they are feeling about coming back to the office and how, whether they would like to continue, etc. So there are various ways in which we have a feel for the wider staff group and how they will um, respond to the changes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chris, is that a legacy hand or a new one? Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon, Chairman. No, it's a legacy. No problem. Okay, members, are we content to adopt those recommendations? Green. Agreed. Nobody against? Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And uh, going back to the agenda, that was the open workplace policy. We now come to the point where we've got a couple of sensitive items to discuss and the exclusion of the uh, press and public. And I don't know if I have to read this out in its entirety, but the recommendation is that in relation to the following item, the press and public be excluded from the meeting as it's likely in the view of the nature of the business to be transacted that uh, uh, if a member of the public were present uh, it would lead to the disclosure of exempt information are we agreed that that would be a sensible thing to do yes agreed. everyone in agreed. the group marie could you then let me know when